So, uh, well, let's get going because otherwise I will continue uh, the nonsense of the time. And this is okay. So, this is essential. Uh, I need to hide this. I need to uh, how to hide this. Okay. Okay. So, this is my table of content. I believe that most of you are not familiar with magnetocalorics. Me neither. So mm -hmm. I will try to give a brief introduction of what it is and why it can be relevant. And then we will move to how we can apply that thing to rock magnetism. And the justification of why we are studying magnetocalorics is uh, here. This is a slide that I borrowed from uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And we see an energy flow chart. And probably those people at the end of the room cannot read everything. I will walk you through the image. So here on the left, we have the different primary energy sources that we can use. We go from solar, nuclear, hydro, down to petroleum. And we see that the situation is pretty bad because most of the energy that we are consuming nowadays is coming from petroleum. And that is not a uh, renewable energy source. So we are trying to move out of that. The other important column that we have is here, distinguished one, that is the different sector where we use the energy. We have residential, commercial, industrial, and transportation. And we if we focus on transportation, again, we see that most of the energy is coming from petroleum, which is again pretty bad. So every government is trying to convince us to move to electrical vehicles, but that is an expensive change to me. The most important part of this slide is here on the right, these two gray boxes. That gray is the energy that we are consuming and is giving us some service, something useful. And in light gray, what we see is the fraction of energy that is going to waste. And we realize that most of the energy that we are consuming nowadays is going to waste. And why is this important? Well, if we follow back where this majority part is coming from, it's coming from this orangey box here, that is the conversion of the different primary energy sources into electricity. And the point is that most of the devices making this conversion are based on magnetic materials. So if we are able to improve the energy efficiency of our magnetic materials, we will be able to make an impact into the society. The thing is that magnetocalorics is a good candidate to make that improvement. Because if we remember that flow chart, we realize that around 42% of the total energy that we are consuming is used in the uh, residential and commercial sectors. And out of it, half is used for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. So again, if we are able to make more efficient temperature control devices, we will be able to make a real impact into the society. There are measurements of the energy efficiency of these prototypes, and there are no magnet uh, magnetocaloric commercial refrigerators get. These are only prototypes. And we can get a significant improvement in efficiency with respect to the best fridge or air conditioner that you can have at home. We don't have to use greenhouse effect or uh, ozone depletion gases. And for some applications, it's very important that there is no vibration or noise. And the point is that there is a a strong link between studying magnetocaloric materials and studying phase transition in magnetic materials. And that is the connection between what we do to save the world and what we want to do to understand how the world is working. And that is the most important thing in this work. So once I justify why this could be important, let me show you what is the effect. And for that, let me play a short Cartoon. So many security things. Okay, probably. So, if we want to measure magnetocaloric effect, the first thing we need is a variable magnetic field that is represented by this electromagnet. 
Then we need a magneto calor example and a way of measuring its temperature that is represented by the thermometer on the right of the image. And then if we apply field and remove it, we see that there is a reversible temperature change in our sample. And that reversible temperature change is the magnetocaloric effect that we want to characterize. But if I focus a little bit more on the material, then we see that we can separate our system in two subsystems. On the one hand, we have the lattice, and we are at a finite temperature, so there are lattice vibrations. And on the other hand, we have the magnetic subsystem, and in this cartoon that is very simplistic, I'm representing that, that in the absence of magnetic field, these magnetic moments are randomly fluctuating. We can now apply field to the right of the image. And then no wonder that the magnetic moments will align parallel to the field. And that means that the entropy of the magnetic subsystem will decrease, it's more order. But if we apply the field adiabatically, that means that the total entropy has to remain constant. Then this decrease in the magnetic entropy has to be compensated with an increase of the lattice entropy. So we will have more lattice vibrations and the material heats up, as we see in the thermometer. Then we can keep the field, but pass some heat transfer fluid through my material to bring it down to the initial temperature. And at that moment, I can remove the field again and then I will increase the magnetic entropy, and in return, I get a decrease in the lattice entropy. The material cools down. Now I have a chunk of cold magnetocaloric material that I can put in contact with the content of a chamber by passing a heat transfer fluid and extract heat from that chamber where we have the beer, the food that we want to have later. If I make this in a cycle, I will be able to build a refrigerator. So this is the principle of how a magnetocaloric refrigerator works. Let me close this. And then uh, let me show you some direct measurements of this effect. That was only a cartoon. But if we look at the real temperature of the sample, we apply still quickly, that is in black, and we see that the sample heats up quickly. And then I didn't isolate the sample properly on purpose so that it relaxes back to the initial temperature. I remove the field quickly, the sample cools. So it's not just a cartoon. We can do that really in the lab. And this was done in a modified lecture version that Tetsu was reprogramming so that these things were possible. OK, so are there prototypes for this? Yes, the first one was the one from GE, and uh, this was in 2014. Uh, well, this is the magnetocaloric thing, this ugly box, and there were two versions of the same device. One was cooling, uh, being in America, I will remove the adjective, a uh, beer bottle, and here we have a can of the same brand of beer. Okay, so this looks like a joke, really, but the, it in, made a lot of sense. Imagine that I have here on top of my table a device that is working, and I want to convince you that the system is really cooling down. Then there are two options. You can come one by one and touch the system, and then you will notice that it's cooling down. I can do that in this room with this amount of people, but if I have a huge auditorium, that is not doable. So the only good thing about these beers is that they have an indicator on the label. And we have a very strong association of blue dot means cold beer. So if I put this to work and I see that the blue dot becomes blue, then everybody in the audience will be convinced that the system. Then there was another prototype of one year later in the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. This was done by Hire in cooperation with Astronautics Corporation of America and BASF, and we see that this is a wine cooler. So at this moment, most of you have two conclusions. There is a strong uh, association between magnetocalories and alcoholism. <laughs> the second thing is that, uh, well, I was claiming that magnetocalories will save the world, but will kill our leader. <laughs> 
Well, the magnetocarbonic device is going inside this box here. And you remember I was telling you there were some specific applications for which the lack of vibrations were very important. If you are very fond of very expensive wine, you don't want to transmit vibrations to the wine because you will degrade the quality. And this is one of the reasons why this was so successful. Also, if you spend a lot of money on a single bottle of wine, you don't mind spending a little bit more on these kind of devices and so on. And so on to your friend. Okay, but there are many other possible applications, and I will go quickly over it. What I was saying is I was giving energy and getting back temperature changes from the system. I can do the opposite. I can give a temperature change and get back energy or work. And that is a thermomagnetic motor or generator that can work on this same principle. We can use these to cool down data centers. You know that data centers are mostly located in northern countries because we don't want to pay too much for the air conditioning that is needed. If we are able to have efficient air conditioning that is not consuming too much, then we will be able to distribute these data centers all over the surface of the planet, and that will be good for data transmission. Electric mobility is important, not only because of the air conditioners inside the car, and believe me, in Sevilla in summer, you need air conditioning if you want to survive. The other thing is that when you want to charge the batteries quickly, we all know with the mobile phones that they heat up. So if we want to extend the battery life, we need to cool them down. And that is another application where you don't want vibrations and noise in your system if you are paying a lot for that big device. There are biomedical applications, like you can have some switchable MRI uh, contrast agents that will tell you not only the topography of your patient, but also the local temperatures. So we will know where the problems are coming from in the different parts of the body. We can uh, do controlled drug delivery, or we can even use for hydrogen liquefaction. And you know that nowadays hydrogen is a very uh, fanciful topic. We got a big uh, European Union project specifically on that. Okay, so now we know what is the effect. I will be very briefly tell you how we can measure it because it will be relevant from for what we want to comment. So there are two possibilities to measure directly and we are looking for temperature changes. So let's put a temperature sensor on top of our sun. If you have a big sample, that is fine. If you have powders, then you have a problem because the thermal mass of your sample will be large, uh, smaller than the thermal mass of your sensor. So there are ways of solving that. But another big problem is that these devices are usually not commercial. So you have to make your own device. The alternative is to make indirect measurements. And you can do the difficult way, that is measuring calorimetry as a function of temperature. And in that way, you measure heat capacity as a function of temperature and field. And uh, well, if you do the max, you can get the entropy by integrating from zero value. If this is large to integrate from zero Kelvin, if you go to the lab, I bet you cannot do that. So you can do some approximations, and at the end of the day, you can get your entropy as a function of temperature. And when you magnify that central part, then if you sit at a constant temperature, you see these, temperature, these entropy differences, that is the adiabatic temperature, isothermal entropy change, or if you sit at a certain level of entropy, then you see your adiabatic temperature change. So you can fully characterize your material by doing this. But again, these devices are not broadly available in every car. But I bet that most of us in this room have a magnetometer that can measure as a function of temperature. And luckily, we can do magnetic measurements as a function of temperature and field. And from that, by some numerical processing, we can get the magnetic entropy. So we will get our peaks of magnetic entropy change when we have some kind of phase transfer. Okay, so 
you want to know how to measure better? There is a book that we edited together with Brad Dodrill from a lecture. And you see how to measure magnetocalorics there. There is a excellent chapter from Ramon Egli about how to do fork analysis. So I think it's a useful tool for uh, postgraduate students that want to learn how to make some of these measurements. If you have an old, an older DSM from lecture, making magnetocaloric measurements is point and click for the 8600. Not yet, but we hope that it will be out very soon. And uh, these things sound much more complicated than what they are. At the end is you put your sample, you use your proper measurement, measurement protocol, and the analysis can be really straight. So why do we think that this can be applied to rock magnetism? Well, let me focus on that. And these are some measurements that Josh sent me. This is a, some, a set of results coming from Sky Spring, that is a, a hematite standard. Different grain sizes, and we have not only hematite, but we have a little bit of goitite. In this case, we are looking at the room temperature remanence on heating and cooling, or we can also do some zero field cooling and field cooling experiments. And what do we see here? Well, there are several features that are on the first hand, there is an abrupt transition here that is from low magnetization to higher magnetization that is hysteretic in uh, temperature. And that is the marine transition that is an order this uh, steel reorientation transition that happens at relatively low temperature. And that is hysteretic as a function of temperature. And that will bring me back to the temperature fork that we will want to do at the end. On the other hand, if we look here on the right, then we see that the marine transition, again, is visible in the zero field cooling, field cooling experiment, but there is no hysteresis. And at the beginning, this was a little bit puzzling until we realized that for geophysicists, the zero field cooling, field cooling measurements are always done on heating. And then there is no thermal hysteresis because you are always going in the same direction. There is another contribution here that is very evident uh, in this blue curve. And this uh, is coming from Goitai. So we have two phases the sound, inside our sound. And depending on what we did before, it will be more visible or less visible, like the difference we see here and there. So there are some other things we can do with these kind of samples. Brad has been measuring a lot of fork diagrams on this same sample. Again, we have the two phases, the hematite and the goitite, and for me, it's not too evident to see that in these four distributions. So what I thought is, are we able to distinguish something if we do, uh, if we do magnetocalorics? So if we go into the magnetocalorics, I don't have my own measurements yet, but I went to the literature and we were able to see the marine transition in hematite, and we see, several important features. So this temperature is different from what we saw in that standard before, because the transition is depending on the particle size and these particle sizes are different. Second thing is that there is a strong dependence of the transition with field and the transition is relatively abrupt. And you remember that the magnetocaloric effect can be calculated from the derivative of magnetization versus temperature. So if we have an abrupt change in magnetization as a function of temperature, most likely we will get a significant magnetocaloric effect. And indeed, we can have it. We have, we have these magnetocaloric uh, peaks that shift with field as we increase the field from almost zero Tesla up to six Tesla, which was the maximum. So the takeaway message here is, if I ask you, 
where do you identify more easily features? Here on the left or on the right? I will not wait for an answer that I don't like. So, <laughs> in my opinion, it's easier to see uh, things when you have peaks and it's easier to identify the features when you go to magnetocalorics and not when you look at temperature dependence of magnetization only. And the second thing is, if we have this clear peak, are we able to make this deconvolution of the different phases that we have? Well, if we look closely, this is a different sample from the one before. So we don't know how much goitite we have here, but we see something that is a positive peak in Delta S and we see something small that is a negative peak in Delta S. So apparently there are two different phases. I cannot move forward with geological samples. They are still on their way to Sevilla, but I can show you some examples of similar problems that we tackle with completely different materials. And for that, I have to show you a very briefly a tool that we developed to try to do these deconvolutions. I didn't check what time I started. I don't know how bad I am doing with time. Good, you got another 15 minutes or so. Okay, good. Then uh, let me speak a little bit about universal scaling. So when you measure the magnetocanonic effect as a function of temperature for different maximum applied fields, you see that the larger the field, the largest is the response. If you want to make a device and you want to introduce the data of your sample inside the model of the device, then we thought that we need a lot of points to put inside our model when we are using all this data. So we were trying to find an alternative to do some data reduction and to use a single curve to describe our material as a function of any temperature at any field. And that is what we were looking for, to rescale the magnetic entropy change data as a function of temperature so, so that all the previous curves were falling onto the same universe. How to do that? Well, I will not go too much into the details, but we have to consider that this field dependence of the magnetic entropy change can be written as a power law, and there are three different temperature regimes. We have at low temperature, well below the Curie temperature in this case, a linear behavior, parabolic behavior at high temperatures when we are in the paramagnetic range. And we have a minimum here when we are at the Curie transition and that is related to the critical exponents of the material. That is different to the critical region that some speaker was mentioning before. So we are speaking about different things, but there are three regimes. Okay, but all these curves look essentially the same. So let me try to find a trick that is model independent to try to collapse all those data. So if I try to find equivalent points here, then I can ask the audience and which is the point that is equivalent for all those cases? Of course, the peak. So we can normalize with respect to the peak. And then I can also check the temperatures that give me a certain percentage of the peak value. And in this case, if I remember well, it's 70% of the peak. That number is right. Okay, so I chose 70. If anybody wants uh, 40 or 90, we can do it for another two. So these are the temperatures that for each of the cars are giving me 70% of the peak above the transition temperature, or below the transition. So next step, I normalize with respect to the peak and no wonder everything, all those crosses are at the same level. And then if there is a universal curve, that means that if I rescale the temperature axis in such a way that these four crosses collapse onto the same point, then the rest of the curves should collapse onto the same uh, point. And if I do that, and it's very easy to do that mathematically, we see that at least with this simulated data, 
everything collapses onto a universal. So, you know, I can play with numbers and make some tricks so that things collapse. Let's go to the lab, let's make, let's make measurements. And here we have 96 different cars for different values of the field. And these are experimental data. If I rescale the data in that same way I told you, we see that everything collapses nicely onto a universe. And the reason for this is that this is a second order phase transition. Okay, we can apply to other nanoparticles. And this was a exotic case in collaboration with Harry Stinkham of the University of South Florida. And this is a, a, a steam freezing transition in a set of coarse nanoparticles. So it's a completely different thing from a Curie temperature. And we see again that everything collapses nicely. So it seems that the method works and we can uh, expand to different uh, kind of materials. What I'm saying is that if I have a few dependence of delta S, I can get the universal car. If I have different alloys from the same family, same critical exponents, I can get the universal car and I can move from one to the other. So why is this good for? What is this good for? Well, there are several things. One is, imagine you cannot go too far in temperature with your device. Then you can, here we have three different alloys from the same family. The blue one is perfectly characterized. The red also, the black is a disaster. I have only two points below it. Let's construct the universal car. And when I do that, I see that all of them collapse onto this shape. And then if I undo the transformation for this black guy here, then I will be able to extrapolate to lower temperatures and predict which is the behavior when I would be measuring at a different temperature range. And if we compare with the experimental results for this same data, there is no difference between this extrapolation and the experiment. Okay, but more interesting for us is what happens when we have several things. And this is a uh, erbium dysprosium aluminum 2 uh, sample. This was in collaboration with Vitaly Pekarsky at same plus. And we see that the delta S as a function of temperature and field has a main peak. But there is some distortion here, which was not too clear what it was. The point is, if I look at the field dependence of this magnetic entropy change, I can see that this exponent n has two minima. So there is the main transition and another spin reorientation transition that is shifting with field. And that sounds a little bit more similar to the geological sample that we were seeing. And the point is, we can try to use a universal scaling for this guy. And when I do that, then what I see is that the main transition collapses very nicely, and there are some distortions to that scaling. And those distortions are uh, allowing me to extract the contribution of that spin reorientation transition. So this could be a way of doing the convolution of several contributions in our. So this was only a guess by that time, but we continued in that trend. And then we did, well, I collected two examples here. One is relatively easy. We have two second order phase transitions, like two Curie transitions, one after the other. And then uh, what we were doing is to synthesize an alloy that is gadolinium palladium. And in this range of compositions, I will have a mixture of pure gadolinium. And for those of you who don't know, gadolinium is the standard sample for magnetocalorics. So whenever you start doing magnetocalorics, you measure gadolinium to check if you are able to do things properly. And the other phase is this gadolinium palladium. So, Depending on how far we go on this x-axis, we will have more of this phase or more of the calorie. When I measure the magnetocalorie, then I see the two peaks. The one coming from 
gadolinium and the other coming from gadolinium palladium. And I can control how much of those peaks I have in my cell. I can do the scaling of those data. Now I just divide by the maximum so that it's easier. So that is why I flip the orientation of the curves. If at any moment something is not clear, please stop me, yell at me. And... Okay, I, I will stop there. Don't throw something. So we can focus on this first curve here, the first peak, to do the scaling based on the low temperature peak. Or we can scale the high temperature peak. We can choose which one we want. If we do with the first, when we scale the low temperature peak, for higher and higher fields, we have more and more overlapping of the two transitions. That means that the high temperature peak in this rescale temperature axis moves closer to the first peak. But we see that there are some features here that are common for most of the curves. We can do the same on the right. And when we do that, we see that the high temperature peak remains in place and the low temperature peak moves closer to the other one. Again, more overlapping. And again, we see that there are some parts that are common for all of them. So what do we do? Let's get the low field. Low field is when the peaks are more separated. And when I get that, for both cases, I can predict which would be the contribution of each of the phases if they were isolated. By doing that, I can deconvolute, uh, separate which is the contribution of each of the phases to the total peak. So um, this is the separation we were doing for low field and high field measurements. I can also predict which would be the total response of the sample to see how good or how bad is my reconstruction. And remember that I am not imposing any model here and just doing some phenomenological analysis of the data. And we can compare what we get with XRD and what we get with this analysis. And when we do things properly, well, with XRD, we get this horizontal black line. Of course, XRD are field independent. So I have a single value. If I do things properly in that deconvolution, I don't have time to enter into the details, then we will get this red curve and we see that we get the same value as we were getting with XRD. So by making magnetic measurements, we are able to predict how much fraction of the phases we are getting inside our sample. But the Morin transition was a first order phase transition. So that thing I was doing one moment ago is not valid for that one. I have the white light, second order phase transition. We are looking at the uh, Curie temperature and the hematite with the Morin transition. So what we did is we looked at the Heusler alloy and this card here, is more or less similar to what we saw in that geological sample. We have something that has low magnetization, transits to high magnetization, and there is a Curie transition afterwards. The magnetocaloric response is what we see down here. We have a negative peak coming from the Curie transition and a positive peak coming from the first order phase transition. I can do exactly the same. I can do the universal scaling on the second order phase transition, this peak here. And when I do that, I see that the first order phase transition peak is getting closer and closer. I can do the subtraction of what is coming from the part that is scaling and the part that is not scaling. And by doing that, I can extrapolate to lower temperatures the response of the Curie uh, transition. I subtract both of them, and then I see which part is coming from the first order phase transition, and the rest is the residuals, the errors that I was uh, having because of the tails of the curve. 
So we are pretty convinced that by using magnetic calorics, we will be able to separate these contributions when we have several different phases without having to impose any knowledge about the material. Because many times when you are trying to deconvolute things, you impose that you know something and then you check that your assumption was correct. Here, we are not doing that. And uh, I don't know how much time I have uh, for temperature fork, probably nothing. It is a fork for itself. <laughs> okay. Sorry for the dinner. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, the thing is, uh, if we are talking about magnetocaloric, this hysteresis is really important. Well, it depends. If and we are trying to make a refrigerator, then we will be heating and cooling the material, we will be applying steel and removing steel. And you know that whenever we have hysteresis, these are energy losses. So we don't want hysteresis when we are making a refrigerator, then that will be really negative. But if we are trying to make a thermomagnetic generator, then there are some numerical simulations showing that if there is a little bit of hysteresis in our material, then we will get some increased performance. And in that case, hysteresis will be positive. And there are other applications that I don't want to go into detail that they are not working in cycles. So in that case, hysteresis is not relevant at all. It's not a problem. So my takeaway message here is that hysteresis is not intrinsically good or bad. It depends on which is the final application. And the main thing is that we need to understand where that thermal hysteresis is coming from to understand it and then to maximize it when we need it or suppress it when we don't. And we are in a core workshop, but as you said, so how to characterize hysteresis, of course, fault. And we can do conventional fault when we don't care too much about temperature, but we can also do temperature fault. And in that way, we are doing essentially the same. The only thing is that instead of having uh, the ID of interaction field and the coercivity, we will have the hysteretic temperature and the shift in temperature in our loops. And instead of sweeping fields, we will be sweeping temperatures. The problem is that sweeping field is fast, especially with the new, uh, new lecture. Sweeping temperature, takes forever, especially if you don't want to have overshoots. So this kind of temperature force and T force is uppercase T, uppercase Trump, lowercase T is not time dependent force. So I, I want to avoid misunderstanding. So where did we apply this uh, temperature force? We were looking at Hoysler alloys. Again, we have a a phase transition from martensitic to austenitic. In this specific composition that we were looking at, the low temperature phase is weakly magnetic. The high temperature phase, the austenite, is strongly magnetic. If we plot magnetization as a function of temperature, we see very nice hysteresis loops. So we can drive the transition using temperature, or we can also drive the transition using field. And we again get hysteresis loops as a function of field. But take into account that this is the origin of field and magnetization. So it's a slightly different uh, from what you are doing in the other time. So we can process the data in the same way that we do for the conventional form, and we see our colorful plots. At the beginning, well, nobody was doing these things. It was very difficult to understand what was going we saw that there were two major peaks that as a function of field, these features were remaining, but this was essentially a fingerprinting technique. That the reason for that, you guys have been doing a lot of modeling for field sort for more than 30 years. So you understand very well when you have a boomerang, a wishbone or a butterfly or whatever, nobody was doing these things uh, here. So the, all, the other problem that we were having is time. So 
Unfortunately, I had a very good student that uh, he decided not to get, take holidays during one summer. Unfortunately, the central facilities have the PPMS without any use during that time. And he was measuring temperature hysteresis for one full month. When the bill arrived, <laughs> he wanted to die and I will never confess that I wanted to kill him. But then uh, the driving force at that moment was how to get the same information for a lower price without losing the knowledge that we are getting about this. And then we were comparing how long it would take if we measure the loops as a function of temperature of a specific sample or when we measure as a function of field. And we saw that at least the time is doubled when we are measuring temperature uh, hysteresis. But then we thought, at the end of the day, what we are doing is to drive a transformation giving energy. We are going from a low temperature phase to a high temperature phase. And that energy is coming either from magnetic field, which is cheap, or from temperature, which is expensive to measure. So then we thought, why don't we propose an effective temperature? That is essentially a measure of the energy that we are giving to the material. And we are giving the energy in these two flavors. So I'm proposing this effective temperature as a addition of the temperature plus the magnetic energy. And let me rescale this experimental data as a function, not of field and temperature, but as a function of the effective temperature. So this looks as a function of field were cheap. When I rescale them as a function of this effective temperature, we see that we are getting very nice forks as a function of the effective temperature. And when we rescale these loops that cost us a small fortune as a function of this effective temperature, we realize that this poor guy was measuring once, once again, and once more the same loop when we plot it as a function of the effective temperature. So the thing here is, instead of using real temperature, why don't we use this effective temperature? And someone will ask me, okay, if that is true, why don't you plot both together to see if you are really getting the same kind of information? Let's get the largest loop of each of those sets of curves, and we see that essentially everything overlaps. Someone will complain that the width is slightly different in one case than the other, but there is a reason for that. So what we were trying to do is to measure the fraction of the transformation as a function of the effective temperature. And we wanted to go at two Kelvin per minute because we cannot go too fast, otherwise the sample heat trap is because of the magnetocaloric uh, response of the material. When we do in isofield conditions to switch the effective temperature in isofield conditions means to switch the temperature at a constant rate. We want the two Kelvin per minute, not too bad, 199 is fine. When we do in isothermal conditions, what we are trying to do is to sweep the field in such a way that the effective temperature goes at two Kelvin per minute. And that is tricky to do it. We didn't do it perfectly. We went a little bit slower, 176. And if you were measuring hysteresis loop as a function of the speed, then you know that the faster you go, the faster the loop gets. And that is essentially what we are seeing here. The small difference in the rate gives us a slightly different history. So it seems that the, these things work. If we look at the temperature fork diagram as a function of the effective temperature, then not only qualitatively the diagrams are the same, but quantitatively they are appearing at the same temperatures and the same position. So we were very happy about that, but how to interpret what is going on? So for that, we need to do models. And if you are working on magnetocaloric materials with a first order phase transition, you will be very familiar with the Bing and Rothbell model. Here, you don't know about that. I don't care. 
uh, we will have this loop here in dot uh, cars. That is the saturation. But there are no minor loops inside. We are going from one phase to the other. So it's impossible to do four out of that. So we need a gradual transition from one phase to the other, and that is what is happening in reality. And how to do that? We introduce a probability of the transformation that is not a Gaussian distribution, because that is too easy, it's a skewed Gaussian distribution. And then we can have differences when heating and cooling. Essentially, we are able to make this gradual transition from one phase to the other and back. Okay, so if we introduce the different parameters in the model, we can have no skewness in the distribution, which means everything is symmetric. And then if the width of the transformation is the same when heating and cooling, we will get essentially circles. When we uh, look further, we see that it's not the same to heat up, to cool down, because we see some tails here, depending in which direction we are going. And that is due to the temperature dependence of magnetization that we are having. On top of that, we can make differences in the width of the transformation when we are heating or when we are cooling, remember that we are transforming between a low symmetry to a high symmetry phase or vice versa. So it's not equally easy to form one phase inside the other, depending on which direction you are going. So this is physically reasonable to find this kind of behavior. And what we see is that we get ellipses that are tilted in different orientations, depending on which transformation is broader. And not only that, we can introduce that asymmetry because at some moment, the existing phase will hinder the other one to grow up. And when we introduce this asymmetry in the transformation, then we see that we have these different triangles pointing in the different orientations. So at the end of the day, we have our cheat sheet that is, we compare not with boomerangs, uh, et cetera, et cetera, but we will look for ellipses, lines, or uh, uh, triangles. Okay, so we try to apply that to a real sample. Again, a Hoisler alloy because it's very relevant for magnetocalorics. And we were doing this in collaboration with some people from Parma, and they are very experienced in synthesizing these alloys. When we made the measurements, we told them there is something not quite right. There is this ridge here that should be coming from a slowdown of the transformation that we are having when we are heating the sample. Initially, they didn't believe that that was happening. They did some further microscopy and they realized that it was really the case. So by doing this, temperature for can identify the different features. We were also making our models and trying to correlate with the different experiments. And we were able to understand what was happening in these transformations. So uh, probably most of you are thinking at this moment, is there light at the end of this time? And uh, well, my message here is that magnetocalorics is a promising energy efficient technology that is good for saving the world, okay? But we can also use it to understand what is happening in the world itself. So we can use for deconvoluting different phase transitions, different phases that we have in our samples. And when we look at this temperature form, we can find features that were not evident when we were making only Magnetocaloric analysis. So, before finishing, I have to thank my collaborators in Sevilla and the funding agencies that pay for this work. So, thank you very much for your attention. Questions from all? For a month.
Yes, uh, I was looking for this equation because it's easier if I focus on this. If you want a large magnetocaloric response, you need a large temperature dependence of magnetization. How do you get that? If you are at very low temperatures, if you have a paramagnetic sample, susceptibility will diverge when you are going to uh, zero Kelvin. So we have a large temperature dependence of magnetization. But we will not be measuring near zero Kelvin because it's very expensive. That means that we need to find something that has a strong temperature dependence of magnetization. If the response is pretty flat, you will not see much. Not only that, maybe you will have a signal that is essentially around here. But as I said before, this part of the curve is a continuous evolution. It's not too easy to find features there. So the main message here is find peaks. And when you have peaks, you have easier ways of determining what is happening in your cell. So it's like with the singular point detection that people were using when studying anisotropy or when you do four, that essentially you are making derivatives to find peaks. And when you have those peaks, you identify better distributions. So if you don't have a transition of whichever type, it can be ferromagnetic to super paramagnetic. It can be a spin reorientation transition. It can be a spin glass. It can be anything that has to be reversible. Then you will have a significant magnetocaloric response and you will be able to study in this, in this way. If not, I will go to other techniques. I don't know if that is, uh, if the answer is clear. Right? That someone else? Uh, no, I didn't see. I, I can ask myself questions. I know the flaws of this thing. <laughs> no, really? Okay. No, thank you very much.